Uh, I'd like to thank ARM and the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to present. Uh, this is our first year as a member of ARM, and I'm very excited to be here to introduce to you Dyna Therapeutics. Uh, this all started with work done in the lab of George Church at Harvard uh, over the last four years. And you know he has an amazing track record for developing new technologies and commercializing those technologies in a transformative way. Um, everything you need to know about Dyna is actually on this slide, so we are focused on developing and applying new technologies to AV capsid engineering for applications in gene therapy and genome editing. Um, we optimize the capsids in particular for in vivo delivery, and our business model is built as a platform. So through licensing, through partnerships, uh, we will take these therapies into humans. Now, uh, for AV, there's a, a set of things which are pretty much shared universally across the field of the wish list of therapeutic partners. Uh, what would we like AV to be? Uh, it needs to be more efficient for going into target tissues, not only just for the targets, but also to be specific for those targets. So high on target rate, low off target rate. Uh, it needs to avoid uh, pre-existing immunity in particular and to have a favorable immunogenic response. Uh, it would be great if we could increase the packaging size in order to fit larger cargoes, and we also need the ability to manufacture it at high titer. Now, no natural or engineered AV capsid has ever had more than a handful of these altogether, but we think that thanks to new technologies, we'll be able to build the complete package of uh, purpose-built synthetic AV capsids, which are uh, optimized and designed for in vivo applications in humans. Uh, the reason why we think that's possible is if you look at um, the natural isolates, the natural serotypes, which uh, most of the activity in the space today is focused around these, we've really only explored a very small region of the sequence space, just a handful of mutations away from these natural variants. Whereas when you compare um, the differences between all of the natural diversity, there's hundreds of changes, even up to 50% differences across those. So there's huge potential to explore this area. It's been uh, unexplored with existing technologies, and we believe that the, the best delivery tools will be found within these unexplored areas. Now, to compare what we're doing with uh, kind of the state of the art before we started this project, mainly directed evolution, um, there's a few different components of these workflows. Uh, for directed evolution, you might start with a random library, whereas uh, for our approach, we focus on direct DNA synthesis, which means we have complete control over every member that goes into the library. For the selection strategies, uh, typically there's multiple rounds of enrichment, whereas thanks to new technologies, we can actually do these selections um, through DNA sequencing, which means both we can do it in a single round so it's faster, but also, we are able to capture information about what's happening within the library. And that's important because we can screen for improvements, um, not just for a single property, like with directed evolution, but across multiple properties, which means we can optimize the capsids for everything they need to do to be used in humans. Most importantly, because uh, we have the ability to control the composition of the libraries with the DNA synthesis, it enables a new workflow for directed evolution, which we call data-driven design, and we think this has very favorable advantages compared to what was possible before. Now, this is not to say that um, there's problems with directed evolution, which actually is an amazing tool. And as of this morning, if you didn't know, uh, Nobel Prize winning work. Uh, we just believe that with new technologies, it's possible to accelerate the rate of identifying favorable capsids uh, using directed evolution workflows. Now, the, the key innovation, what we've been working on uh, in George Church's lab, has been the ability to measure the in vivo delivery properties and high throughput. In particular, by making capsid mutations, linking those to a DNA barcode, and as I mentioned, using the DNA barcode to read out the effects in vivo. The really amazing thing is, thanks to these new technologies, we can screen a huge number of capsids in whatever model is relevant for delivery. In particular, hundreds of thousands of changes can be screened in a single animal, and by measuring multiple things, we can get a million measurements per animal. Now, uh, this is the workflow that we've set up around these assays, namely the DNA synthesis as the beginning, then we do the selections for each of the different properties for AAV, the readout is the DNA sequencing, and then taking that information, applying different algorithms and uh, machine learning techniques, we can extract meaningful information from that, use that to go back into the design of a new library. 
So I'll tell you a little about the results that we've achieved. This is all work done in George Church's lab. Uh, and this has been the basis of the work that we are now commercializing as part of Dino Therapeutics. Uh, there's two algorithmic approaches, two different ways in which we've thought about applying these technologies to capsid engineering for different purposes. Uh, we call these a wide search and a deep search approach. For a wide search, it's, uh, it's trying to gather as much information as we can about what's important for the capsid, mainly by making all of the single changes, all of the first order effects. Uh, once we know the landscape, we know which things are beneficial and deleterious, then by focusing on the things which are more favorable, combining them together in uh, combination, we can explore far away from the natural uh, isolates, and that's what we call the deep search approach. So I'll tell you about that uh, first with the wide search. Here is showing you an assay for AV production, um, all the single changes. So every pixel here is a different single amino acid change, actually a different codon change. And this is comprehensive. So we make at every position all possible codon changes. Here they're grouped uh, by amino acids, and you can see uh, there's quite a lot of information in this data. Uh, the white things are those which are neutral. Uh, in this case, the same as AV2, which is the starting serotype. Red things are beneficial, so they have increased efficiencies of productions, whereas the blue ones are deleterious and failure to package. Uh, zooming out, actually, that same data, uh, but just showing you the amino acid changes. And this is all done in one experiment. And actually, this is the entire experiment. So it shows you all possible substitutions on the top at every position, plus all possible insertions down below. Now, we can learn a lot of interesting things from these types of experiments, in particular, structural information. If you take this data, plot it back on the structure, we learn what's important, mainly the inside versus the outside. But there's also much more information contained in the data because at every position, we also know which amino acids are favorable. The main point here is to show you that uh, while structure has been the starting point for protein engineering for some time, uh, we believe that using a purely data-driven approach, we can extract whatever meaningful information was there in the structure, plus build on that through developing new assays. Uh, in addition to the in vitro work there with production, we can measure in vivo uh, delivery properties. So here, taking that same viral library, now giving it to a mouse uh, through systemic injection, going in and looking at every major organ, uh, we can measure the biodistribution properties for every uh, mutant. Here showing you just a sampling of the organs. This is just one mutation. And of course, in the context of all the other possible mutations, you, there's much more information here, also much more interpretable. So you can notice patterns that are only apparent when looking at the entire data set. Uh, here is, again, uh, efficiency of delivery, starting from the viruses, but now going into each of the different tissues. And you can see how diverse and uh, you know, meaningful this would be. We can take that information now and apply it for the design of improved capsid variants. This is all with single mutations, and the question is, can we build upon that to explore farther away into sequence space? So here is a pilot of that deep search approach where we try to make a large number of changes, uh, focusing on one region of the capsid, in this case, 20 amino acids, making anywhere from one to 42 mutations, which is basically every position has been modified. Um, what's really surprising and, and quite exciting in our mind is that we can introduce a huge number of variants, in particular, uh, 10 to 15 mutations away from the wild type, which is uh, more than 50% different from where we started. And in other words, that's showing us that we can explore kind of the, the possible variability. It's as different from where we started as the AV capsids are from each other. Uh, this is showing you kind of a split out of two different sets within that data set. So let's compare this uh, data-driven approach to the, uh, the prior state of the art, which was random immunogenesis. And you can see that through incorporating information into the design of the libraries, we are able to make more changes than was possible within with just the random selection. Mainly with random libraries, you're only able to get one to four mutations away. With this deep search approach, we can get 10 to 15. Now, uh, in addition to doing this in one step, we can also learn a lot about what's important for the delivery properties. Uh, so we can apply algorithms, as I was mentioning, like machine learning algorithms, to better understand this data. And that's what I can show you here. Uh, using machine learning, we can further improve our ability to predict whether a change will be beneficial or deleterious far away from the natural serotypes. Uh, and then through iteration on this, through multiple rounds, we can accelerate the search uh, towards purpose-built synthetic AVs. Now, this is just showing you that uh, we can achieve our ultimate goal, which is this multidimensional optimization. So here is showing you first 
filtering out all of the AVs which didn't package, so we're already optimizing for that, plus two additional factors in vivo. Uh, in this case, looking at delivery to deliver, but detargeting from the spleen. So this type of workflow is what will enable us to design AV capsids, which are built for uh, human use. And in summary, for the platform, we've developed a new algorithmic approach to AV engineering. Two different workflows that we like are this wide search and this deep search approach, augmented by the machine learning. And uh, we use these to optimize AVs, in particular trying to um, optimize across multiple properties and all the things which are important for in vivo use. Uh, I'd like to give a brief overview of the business. Uh, of course, there's multiple stakeholders in any business, and uh, you know, patient, employee, and shareholder are a big three. For us, the patient is number one, and we're designing everything around how can we help as many patients be treated with gene therapy or genome editing therapy as quickly as possible. So the business model that we've uh, chosen has been focused upon licensing, in particular uh, leveraging our strengths on the engineering side. Uh, we get this uh, great feedback loop where we do more experiments, which generates more data, which helps us to build better models about what's important for AV, and that enables us to, again, uh, design better AVs and do more experiments. And, in biologist lingo, this is called Hershey heaven, uh, to have one experiment that works and to keep doing it all the time. And we, we really see the, the power of this as a platform and through partnership, uh, through licensing out the capsids um, to th clinical stage partners and then validating those in humans, uh, we believe this is the best way to help as many patients as quickly as possible. Uh, up until now, we've actually been operating as a virtual company, but we will be setting up a lab soon in Lab Central, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, I would just say for the early stage partnerships, what we're looking for are um, the ability to work on a transformative area. We want to enable things which weren't possible before. Of course, the benefit to partners is uh, we would provide you early access to improved AVs. Uh, because we can only take a few of these, but that means we have more flexibility in the, the goals of the partnership. So in particular, the ability to design the AVs around specific indications, that's helpful because we can optimize it for, you know, we can prioritize the wish list of properties based upon the target application. Uh, we're focusing on win-win terms for the licensing, maximizing patient benefit, and of course looking for long-term partnership potential. And uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I'd be happy to chat, and thank you all uh, for your attention.